All right, let's start with a public service announcement and wash your hands. World view. Foundation for everything we do in life. It forms our beliefs, what we hold dear, and that will determine how we act. The basis of the course. Let me ask you this. Why do we put blinders on a horse? Distracted. They're not distracted, so they stay focused, right? A worldview is a blinder for us. It really tends to focus us on how we view the world. We don't see a whole lot of other things. God says, I want you to be focused on my word, my truths, and so you see the world this way. Because the world will distract us and pull us in every different direction if we allow it to. And there is a good reason why we should stay focused on Christ, his word, and what he's encouraged us to do and how we should live our lives. So um, I don't know if they make such a thing, but it might be good to hand them out in church someday or get people focused on what's being preached. Politics. I told you last week we we're going to do law this week. I lied. Um, I knew if I said politics, nobody would come. <laughs> but uh, the course actually does teach law before politics. But the last time I taught it, I found that if you don't have politics and government right, then you won't understand law. It, it kind of flows better the other way, so I'm switching it around. It'll make next week a lot easier. Plus, politics is the art of governing, right? A city, state, or a nation. And last week we taught sociology, where you have right family, church, and state. So it ties in really well with that state piece of it. So uh, here we go. We're going to go into politics tonight from a Christian worldview. One of the most essential things to make any good government work is truth. Right? I'm not sure if he's winking there, but... Uh, <laughs> 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 right, <let's play> <laughs> you know, but uh, again, we can trust our government, right? Uh, that's the whole idea of um, what we're supposed to be in this country, is to be fully trusting government that will never lie to us, even about viruses and things. And we have this unhealthy or unbiblical view of separation of church and state, right? People think that the two have to be separate. There can be no overlap between them. And of course, that's not what separation of church and state means. It's just that the state can't establish a formal religion and force everybody to follow it. It also has to provide the freedom for us to practice our religion. But there is no way that we can separate church and state. We have in God we trust on our money. We swear in the Bible and our court system. The Ten Commandments are posted in most of our government buildings. That was never the intent of the framers to separate church and state. All right, so we're looking at a biblical worldview. Uh, we started with theology. God exists. Philosophy, the spiritual and natural realms exist together. Biology, God created all things. <clears throat> Psychology, humans are made in God's image, fallen into sin. Ethics, God's ethics are absolute. Last week, we looked at sociology, how God has created three institutions to run a society, the family, the church, and the state. And now we're looking at politics. And politics asks the question, what is the purpose of government? <clears throat> and you will see that if you don't have this view that God exists in a supernatural realm, he's separate from the material realm, humans are supernatural in the sense that we're physical and spiritual or eternal, there's an immaterial part to us, and that people are sinful, you will not actually be able to understand how to properly set up a government. So in our sociology, right, we talked about the systematic study of the development, structure, interaction, collective behavior of organized groups of human beings. That's what it is. How do we get together as a society and function? And last week we saw there's three main parts to it, family, church, and state, biblically. These are three institutions that God has ordained. The state is the government, the politics, the part, the ordained um, group of people who tend to rule a society to bring order to it and to allow the church and state, to, the church and family to flourish. All right, so we went through last week. So let me ask you a question. Suppose you have two islands, and one island has all these good-natured, hard-working, family-oriented, honest people on it, and the other island has a bunch of mean, lazy, violent, deceitful person, people on it. 
Which island would have the greatest prosperity and freedom? I mean, the one on the left, right? Yeah. Let me ask you this one. Which one will require the most laws, police, and prisons? Right. One on the right. So if we had perfectly sinless people, we probably wouldn't need government. Right? The reason why we have government is because we are by nature more this side. And the more we are this, the more we need government somebody to govern the society to protect the family and the church, right? So some key ideas in politics. Human government was instituted by God to protect man's unalienable or inalienable, same word, rights from mankind's sinful tendencies. So let's look at this. Was human government actually instituted by God? Romans 13, 1 through 7. Let every person be subject to the governing and authorities, for there is no authority except from God. And those that exist have been instituted by God. So from a biblical world, did God institute government? Yes. Actually says all authorities he instituted. <clears throat> Let every person be subject to the governing authorities, for there is no authority except from God. And those that exist have been instituted by God. Therefore, whoever resists the authorities resists what God has appointed. And those who resist will incur judgment. For rulers are not a terror to good conduct, but to bad. Would you have no fear of the one who is in authority? So whoever resists the authority is resisting God. And he says here, understand that, that, conduct, uh -oh, hit the bush, that, that conduct and authorities are there for the good. Right? If, if there's a speed limit of 55 and you never violate it, well, the government's there for your good. It's going to protect runaway people from driving too fast and being reckless. But if you're a lawbreaker, then you would see government as being bad. But government is good because it keeps society ordered. Right? So do what is good. You'll receive approval. For the government is God's servant for your good. But if you do wrong, be afraid, for he does not bear the sword in vain. For he is the servant of God, an avenger, who carries out God's wrath on the wrongdoer. So police, politicians, and things who rule our societies are actually God's servant. So because of that, we have to be in subjection, not only to avoid God's wrath, but also for the sake of conscience. For because of this, you also pay taxes, for the authorities are ministers of God, attending to this very thing. Pay to all what is owed them, taxes to whom taxes are owed, revenue to whom revenue is owed, respect to whom respect is owed, honor to whom honor is owed. Again, they're ministers of God, and we are therefore to honor them. Jesus said this very succinctly, give unto Caesar what is Caesar's, and give unto God what is God's, right? It's very simply what he made this point. So God established government, and Christians are to respect, honor, and obey their leaders. So that's the first thing. Human government was instituted by God. It was instituted to protect man's unalienable rights. So what is a right? Anybody want to try to take a shot at the definition of a right? What would a human right be? Opposite left? No, I'm kidding. <laughs> Something everyone should have. Something everyone should have, right? A moral or legal entitlement to, ha entitlement to have or obtain something or to act in a certain way. Everybody should have this. It's something to which everyone has a just claim, such as the power or privilege to which one is justly entitled. I have the right to free speech or the right to bear arms or the right to pursue liberty and happiness, right? to prosper, to thrive. So it's a legal, social, or ethical principle of freedom or entitlement given to all people equally. All people equally. We have rights. And those rights are given equally to all people by God. Right? People who are materialistic in their worldview are often very strongly advocates of animal rights. Right? So they might say that our right to bear arms is the same to the right for uh, <laughs> to arm bears, right? And I like this one. After all, cats are people too. I think that's Nicholas Cage, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> uh, all right, enough of that. Uh, there is, there are people who say that all animals have rights, and those rights are equal to human rights. 
because we're basically animals. There is a difference between humans and animals, we would say, from a biblical worldview, because we have a supernatural view that humans are both material and immaterial, created uniquely by God in his image, and therefore our rights given by God are different than rights that animals would have. Interesting discussion if you're talking with an animal rights activist. Mm -hmm. uh, you, can, you can bring this point out that my worldview shows that animals do not have the rights that I do, and they taste good. <laughs> so, where do rights come from? All right. The Declaration of Independence says we hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal, that they are endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights, that among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. So this is not a biblical statement, but it's based on the Bible, right? That we are endowed by our creator with certain unalienable rights. We're all given these rights. That word unalienable means that unalienable means that which cannot be given away or taken away. <coughs> Nobody has the right to take that right. Nobody else has the right to give that right. Here it is. Rights are not gifts from the government. Understand that. They don't have the right to claim a right that's not a right. Is health care a human right? Some people say that it is. Well, that's a government statement, but did God ever make that statement that everyone has a right to health care? We are hearing this all the time, that we have a basic human right to choose our gender or to do whatever it might be. It's like, be very careful how you define a right. Mm -hmm. Only God gives them and only he can take them away. All right, so... Human government was instituted by God to protect these unchangeable rights that God gives us, right? And why do we need government? Because man's sinful tendencies will always try to interfere with these rights. Governments will try to take God-given rights away from people. Or governments will try to force us to treat other people in a certain way because they create rights that we're supposed to accept as being universally true. All right? So... Remember, Christian psychology, we said we're a double exposure. We're made in God's image, but we're totally fallen into sin. As a result of the fall of man, every part of us, our, every part of our mind, will, emotions, and flesh have been corrupted by sin. And I don't know if you remember when I taught this, there was a quote from Norm Geisler, if you don't understand human beings are sinful, you don't understand human beings, and you won't know how to treat them. Well, the other word for treat is govern. You will not know how to govern people if you do not understand that people are sinful, right? Man is not basically good. Man is not basically evil. Man is basically sinful. That is what we are. Most governments assume man is basically good, and then they have a very difficult time trying to rule people who aren't actually good but sinful. So, question. What if angels ruled the earth? Assuming it's the good angels. The sinless angels, those angels who understand God, God's rules, and what humankind is all about, what would that look like? Well, let me ask you this other question. Do angels need government if they're not sinful? They won't treat each other wrong. There won't be crime. There won't be a problem. There's no need to govern angels. But if angels ruled the planet, they would administer God's justice perfectly. They would order the society exactly the way God intended it. And there would be no need for human government if angels could rule the earth because angels don't have the sin nature that humans do, but they fully understand that man has fallen into sin and thereby has the tendency to corrupt the rights that God gave each human being. Right? When we, when we murder somebody else, we've taken away that person's right to life. So whenever there's sin committed, whenever people act in a way that a government needs to step in and protect it or administer justice, it's because in one way or another, sinful humans are infringing on somebody else's right. So, James Madison said, if men were angels, no government would be necessary. If angels were to govern men, neither external nor internal controls on government would be necessary. There would be no check and balance required for any government that was ruled by sinless people. So what's he implying by that? that government itself is sinful, right? And therefore, it needs to be checked by something. So what do we do? Our Constitution framers were very smart in that they built checks and balances into our government. Let's break it out into different groups. We'll have a legislative group, an executive group, and a judicial group, and all three of those are held in check by each other and by the voter. 
we can vote to change these institutions. We can change the way they're structured. So no one group is supposed to have authority over the other. They all are supposed to keep each other in check. Uh, sorry. Yeah, we have to do something about that. It's like a Venus flytrap. It keeps coming after you. Uh, Human government was instituted by God to protect man's unalienable rights from mankind's sinful tendencies. Again, so let's look again at family, right? Love, protect, provide, nurture children. Church is there to preach, teach, reveal, support, demonstrate, show Christ to the world. And the state to serve, protect, maintain, order, administer justice. And when we put all of, if we have just the two, we're going to have a, a vulnerable society, right? There is no state, no government to protect us from evil, from the harms that people might do to us. But if we just have a couple of these without all three, then it could become a, a nanny state or a totalitarian government if they tend to rule over the family. If you just have the state and the church, we could have a power struggle or a civil war. We've seen that in many places in the world where there's no check on each other and they have forgotten that the, the basic institute, the foundation of the society is the family and both of those are there to serve them. When they forget and it becomes a fight between the two, you'll see some sort of civil war erupt, typically, or you'll see a whole new country form when people re, you know, flee religious persecution from a government, right? A la the United States was part of it. You do it all together, right? You get this blessed nation. So each of these institutes is not to unduly influence the other. God must be recognized as the ruler in all three spheres. And people who rely solely on the state may eventually be crushed by it. People who do not have a worldview that involves God as a supreme being who has instituted family and church, they tend to rely almost solely on the government to determine what's fair and what's right and how the society should be ordered. Government alone. Therefore, we need to elect a government that will do what they feel is equitable. Whether that means to distribute income, or have everybody, you know, go to the same schools, do the same kind of things, uh, everybody become uniform, most governments will do that. The best example of that is communism. Communism is a government that basically is atheistic and says we need to control the masses. The people are not allowed to own private property. We will own the means of production. We will make sure that nobody in the society is slighted. Everybody is the same. And what winds up happening is people say, I don't want that. I want my freedom. I want my rights. I want to be able to prosper, to pursue happiness, which is to pursue thriving. So when that happens, the government then will respond, usually violently. Communism has killed 100 million people of their own citizens in 100 years. 100 million people they have killed who have revolted against the government. I want to have more than one child, if you live in China. I want to be able to grow my own food. I want to be able to start my own business. No, you're not allowed to do any of that. The government controls it all. They have ignored the rights of human beings to pursue happiness, to thrive, to have liberty, and in this case, to have life. Unfortunately, um, this is becoming more and more popular now as an ideology. <clears throat> Communism is the philosophical, social, political, and economic ideology and movement whose ultimate goal is the establishment of a communist society in which a socioeconomic order structured upon the absence of social classes and the common ownership of property, money, and the means of production. It's the definition of it. We are going to take away anything that is individual and make it all common to everyone. We will own all property. We will manage all manufacturing. No one will have the right to do anything other than what the government tells them. We have a communist mayor in New York City. He's an avowed communist, and he said this a couple of years ago. What's been hardest in making progress is the way our legal system is structured to favor private property. Look, if I had my druthers, the city government would determine every single plot of land how development would proceed, and there would be very stringent requirements around income levels and rents. He has said he wants to take control of every building in New York City, control the rent for those buildings, and have all of the property belong to the state, 
none of it belongs to the people right now who actually own those buildings. He said the only way we can control things in New York City is for the government to own it all. To come in and confiscate that property and say it's now ours and we will set the rents. And he said the problem with our system today is that people can own private property. We have the right to own private property. There is a commandment that says thou shalt not steal. How can you steal something from me if it's not my property? We have the right to own property. But when a government comes in and says, no, you don't have these rights, we take them away from you, you start having these problems. So as somebody who wants to find politics uh, is the, uh, the, the most powerful thing that large groups of people, stupid people do, you know. We talked about once before, the truth doesn't become truth because the majority of people believe it, right? Never underestimate a group of people who all of a sudden wind up coming up with these new rights that people have, and eventually those rights are forced on other people to where if you don't accept those rights and live according to those rights, you may be thrown in jail or have your business closed down. It's like, where did those rights come from? From government. And we'll see this a lot next week when we get into law. This is why I want to teach this first. You have to understand how government can overreach God's given reach that they were instituted with or set up for. And when they do that, then society starts having trouble. So government is necessary, but it does have God-ordained limits. The Bible calls for limited government, falling between no government, which is a total anarchy, and a totalitarian, complete overthrow of a government. You know, just the government overthrows the entire society. Chuck Colson said, Christianity teaches that the state serves as a divinely appointed and di divinely divine task, although itself is not divine. Its authority is legitimate, though limited. A guy who was one of the highest ranking members in our political system at one time, who went to jail for corrupting the government, violating our laws. So, how many of these would you say are legitimate um, government roles? <clears throat> we could either be talking about biblically or according to our constitution. Administer justice. That's a good one. Collect taxes. Maintain order. Collect taxes. Maintain order. Maintain order. Protect liberty. Protect liberty. Defend human rights. Defend human rights. Protect life. Protect life. You got them. That's it. That's it. Does our government do all the rest of this? Mm -hmm. Yes. <laughs> do they have the right to do it? No. God did not ordain them to do that. Our federal government was set up for two primary purposes. The first purpose was to give it a trade entity for the 50 states or 13 colonies at the time. So if somebody in Europe wanted to sell something to Virginia, they could just sell it to the United States. It could receive its tariffs and its taxes and its import stuff that way, in the same way they could deal with New York State. So it was set up as a trade entity, and actually the government received all of its income from those tariffs. There was no such thing as taxation then. Right? The second thing is the government is established to protect the nation. It is supposed to be a military. It's supposed to protect its citizens. That's one of the things that it's called to do is protect life and maintain order. And in order to do that, it has to be able to be structured in such a way that it can. All of the other things our government has grown into have become beyond the Constitution. Right? Taxes, you could argue, they were tariffs, there were some form of taxes from corporations, but individual income tax has not been around for much more than a hundred something years, right? Yeah. I was just wondering, uh, have you ever read the preamble of the United States Constitution? Mm -hmm. In the preamble, it says promote the general welfare. Yeah. So provide welfare is not one of those roles? Well, there are some things in here that kind of you know, like maintaining order, administering justice, you could you could get that in there. Mm -hmm. The same thing, how do you define the pursuit of happiness? I think I have it in one of my slides, what the framers meant by that word. It's a thriving, it's a prosperity, it's something where people will have their welfare promoted. So yeah, that's good. Welfare means something different today. Yes. So that's it, what he's oh, I see what you're saying. Okay. Yeah, it, so it, 
it's yeah. promote the well-being of this right. of the well, society. Not necessarily like give money to people who right. don't work. Right. Yeah. That's it's a different kind of welfare. Okay. Yes. 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 I'm saying. Okay. Yeah. That's, that's what the it. preamble talks about. You're not talking about the, the money given to people. You're talking about the welfare of people in the preamble, right? The right. well-being. Yeah. Well, again, if if someone doesn't have food to eat, it's the first responsibility of the family. Second responsibility of the church. Right. If you don't provide for your own family, you're worse than an, an infidel. It's first family, then church, then not, then the state should come in and take care of that, right? So we do have the state to protect for the welfare in that sense, but it's primarily family and church first. And we, it used to be that way, where we built hospitals and, and you know, we had soup kitchens and we had, uh, you know, colleges and all these things built by the church for the things the society needed for its flourishing. And we've gone away from that. Because words have changed over the years, I guess. Mm -hmm. Being as words have changed. Over yes, the they have. Be very careful. So control trade, maybe regulate trade. There's a little bit of something in there that we could we'll look at. But one of the other things that we have gone to now from the concept of family and church being the building block of society is this, right? It takes a village to raise a child. It's government society role now in general to raise children and to provide for their education and their welfare I mean, most of our schools here provide every kid breakfast and lunch now, right? And of course, they're in the schools most of their first 18 years of their life. There's things that the government has now taken over that um, we've just kind of allowed them to do it. But was that how God originally set it up? I saw a billboard last week. I think it was over by Brooks Avenue. It says, parents, you've done a great job raising your children. Now let us take it from here. And it was something like New York State, something or other. Really? I was like, I can't believe it. Is that the Blasio? Oh, who said that? Well, New York State. Well, New, York New York State, State let us take it from here. Huh? Yeah. Cuomo. Wow. It was really shocking. But those kinds of things work, right? Yeah. All right. Um, little Kirk Cameron short video here. I found this. It, Kind of the summary of what we we're just talking about. It's not the highest grade video, but it's pretty good. Welcome back. We've been talking about the levers that shape culture. One is education. The second I want to talk about is worldview. Now, you may have heard that uh, term over and over and over again. I know it's talked all the time about here on The Blaze, but worldview is essentially how you view the world, how it works according to your perspective. And one of the key things we need to understand is authority and responsibility. Who has all the power? Where does the authority rest? And with that authority, who's taking responsibility for making things happen so people are liberated, not enslaved? Well, one of the uh, bar none best teachers of this was an old rabbi who is now uh, someone who is listened to and worshiped by more people than anyone else on the planet. Uh, in ancient Israel, Jesus Christ was asked by some of the religious leaders, is it lawful for us to pay taxes to Caesar? Well, they tried to trap him, and his answer confounded them. He said, well, bring me a coin. Whose image is on the coin? And it was Caesar's. And what he said was, give to Caesar the things that are Caesar's, but give to God the things that are God, God's. And what he was teaching was a profound principle of jurisdictional authority. That is that the government has certain jurisdictions to impose authority, like areas of taxation, but other areas where it does not have authority. Um, the question that ought to be asked is, where is God's image placed? Well, that's on us, right? We're made not in the state's image, but God's image. And our children, the area of the soul and of the mind, anything that has to do with our thoughts, our religious worship, our speech, should not be governed by the government. And unfortunately, in our nation, we've slid toward giving Caesar the things that are God's. Mm -hmm. And I want to demonstrate this a little bit more clearly with a, uh, a diagram here. And I want you to see this. Here we've got the founder's view of authority and power and how it works. This is what they believe, and this is what led to the freedom and the blessing in our nation. You have God as the authority at the top, and he bestows jurisdiction to the individual and responsibility for the individual to govern himself under the eternal rules of right, to love and honor the creator. And then he creates the institutions of the family, the church, and the state. And these are separate jurisdictions that should never encroach on one another. 
Meaning, the state should never stick its hand into the church and tell them what to preach from their pulpits. The church should never control the military. The family cannot tell any of these others what to do, neither can they tell them, and none of them trump the liberties of the individual who governs himself under God. And by the way, family is where the responsibility lies for education, health, and welfare. This is a parentally, uh, a parent-guided thing. Health, uh, no one cares more about the health of my grandpa than his own family. And welfare, taking care of the needy and the poor, this is a responsibility of the family. And that's what our founders believed. Now, I want you to look at what tends to happen, and this is what's happening even in our nation, is that things devolve into a system where liberties are stripped away. And what happens, look at our diagram here. The state loves to insert itself and replace God with a state government. You notice the individual has been removed and demoted to down here. And now you have a state that is now controlling both the family, the church, and the individual, and forcing them to conform to the ideas of the state. Very different from over here. The state also is, has taken over and wants to always take over education, health, and welfare, because when you take over these things, now the people become extremely dependent upon you. This ultimately leads to the state gradually consuming you, your family, your business, your religion, and your freedoms. That is not what we want. We want to go back to this over here, and this is your worldview. Can it be done? Yes, because under it all, there is the truth that good is stronger than evil, that life overcomes death, and faith is more powerful than doubt. You get these into your worldview and create the lens through which you look at the world, all of a sudden you've got hope, and you can wake up in the morning whether you're blind or you have just buried a child, and you can still say, I smell victory. Pretty good summary, I thought. Um, was almost gonna show this last week on society, right? Sociology, because it's got family, church, and state. But I think this idea of how the state, not totally in this country, but certainly in a lot of other countries, that is what's happening, that is the driving force behind socialism, is that the state will then determine what all individuals have and they will control religion and family and eventually force you and your business and everything about your life to follow the rules of the state, not your own individual rules and responsibilities. He pointed that out that each human being is responsible before God for the choices they make and how they live their life the individuals collectively make up the society. They determine the state through voting. They determine the makeup of the church and the direction and purpose and preaching of the church. They determine the family, how many children you should have, how you should raise them, how you should teach them. This is the biblical worldview, and, and this is more of a materialistic or atheistic worldview. People who don't have God substitute government for God. Generalizations here, right? But it's a good contrast between the two. William Penn said, if we are not governed by God, then we will be ruled by tyrants. George Washington, it's impossible to rightly govern a nation without God and the Bible. You can't do it. If you don't see God first and don't see his rights given to people and his institutions established, you won't be able to properly govern. So God instituted government. To order the society, right? We look at 1 Corinthians 14. For God is not a God of confusion, but a God of peace. All things should be done decently and in order. Interesting that the word politics means the rule of a city, state, or nation. But it's basically limited to a small rule. Cosmos means the orderly rule of all things. When we talk about the cosmos, we mean it's an orderly rule a whole harmonious and orderly system that is governed by natural law. Can any government control the cosmos, the universe? No, but we do know, scientists know, even atheistic scientists know that there are natural laws that govern the cosmos. Why? Well, first of all, God is a God of order, not of chaos. 
the entire cosmos is based on order. Therefore, when we build a government, which is to rule a very small section of the cosmos, it could be a family, it could be a church, it could be a town, state, city, whatever, that very small microcosm has to be ordered. And its design is to order the society because God is a God of order and he has created the cosmos, the universe, in an orderly way. Second thing government does is promote and administer justice. Right? In government, started in Genesis, whoever sheds the blood of man, by man shall his blood be shed. For God made man in his own image. Capital punishment, great. Old Testament, we're not under that anymore. Well, Colossians 3.25, for the wrongdoer will be paid back for the wrong he has done, and there is no partiality. Our government is supposed to administer justice with a blind eye, right? Impartially. So we have it to create order, maintain order, to promote and administer justice, and then to secure our rights and freedoms. So here we have in Romans 13, we, we looked at this, that Every person has to be subject to the authorities, for there's no authority except for God, and those that exist have been instituted by him. So we talked about this, that the government there is to secure these things, right? He carries out God's wrath on the wrongdoer. Again, rights are not gifts from government. God gives them, and only he can take them away. I found this in the uh, Virginia Declaration of Rights, their, their basic uh, tenet for their state operation. All men are by nature equally free and independent and have certain inherent rights of which when they enter into a state of society, they cannot by any compact deprive or divest their posterity, namely the enjoyment of life and liberty with the means of acquiring and possessing property and pursuing and obtaining happiness and safety. So all, a lot of the same words that we have in our declaration, but this was uniquely put some words in there and then they... In, in our papers, the word thriving, or the word happiness, was described as thriving, prosperity, or well-being, which is what you were talking about, welfare. How do we maintain this as a right given to us by God? Our constitution, whether it be town, city, state, or federal government, or global, the United Nations should have these universal rights as the top priorities. Life, liberty, possession of property, which is interesting they put that in, and then be able to pursue a thriving, prosperous well-being safely with a government administering justice. Even some people who I might disagree with sometimes say this. Here's the thing about rights. They're not supposed to be voted on. That's why they call them rights. People who understand government get this, right? They understand that these are not something that we make up. So here, the person who does secure our freedoms, the person who does carry out justice, is a servant of God. George Washington also said this, The smiles of heaven can never be expected on a nation that disregards the eternal rules of order and the right which heaven itself, itself has ordained. So the government is there to secure those rights, protect those freedoms, and it's also there to protect the church and the family. Right? Again, give unto Caesar the things that are Caesar, and the things that are God's, give those to God. First Timothy, or yes, chapter 2. I urge that supplications, prayers, intercessions, and thanksgiving be made for all people, for kings, and for all who are in high positions, that we may lead peaceful and quiet life, godly and dignified in every way. This is good, and it is pleasing in the sight of God our Savior, who desires all people to be saved and come to the knowledge of the truth. So why should we be praying for our leaders? Why should we be intercessing for them? Why should we be giving thanks? So that these people in high positions can help us lead a peaceful and quiet life, godly and dignified in every way. New Testament principle. Government is good. Yeah. Who is he? He said to them, Jesus? Mm hmm he said to them, Yes, Jesus said that. The render to Caesar things are Caesar's and to God the things are God's. Yep, it's great too. And when somebody said, Should we pay taxes? He says, Go get a fish and pull the coin out. I wish I could do that too. But, uh, <laughs> yeah. That's Caesar's, right? So here we go. Blessed nation when these three things are in balance. When you look at our Pledge of Allegiance, right? What does it talk about? One nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all because we all have the same rights. 
This is what our government was established on, the fact that God is the ruler of the nation. He establishes mm -hmm. these things that are, are for us all, and government should be able to, uh, administering that justice and protecting that liberty. So these are primarily the reasons why God instituted government. Any questions on that? i got one more video to show you quick. Make sense? I'm trying to give you some biblical understanding of what a biblical worldview is, right? People certainly don't agree with this view, especially in modern-day politics. They are definitely moving more toward the state in control. This is one of the most interesting and more I've done yet in politics. Man. This, this, this uh, session is the most interesting one yet. Good. Great. 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 It'd be the most volatile, too, right? <laughs> politics are tough right now. Or very tough. All right, so let's take a look at what... Uh, the people from Summit say. Christians recognize that human government is a social institution established by God. Christians are called to obey it, even to support it. Romans 13.1 establishes how people should view the state. Everyone must submit himself to the governing authorities, for there is no authority except that which God has established. Human governments are obligated to uphold justice, freedom, and order. America's founders understood fallen human nature. They also understood that humans were created in God's image. These two beliefs deeply affected how they established America's government system. Good political philosophy takes into account that human beings are fallen race, <coughs> that they cannot be trusted to do the right thing. And in fact, they can be trusted to do the wrong thing. They can be trusted to put self-interest before other interests. They can be trusted to seek their own pleasure, comfort, ease, and prosperity before seeking that which is good and true and beautiful. And prudent politics takes into account the fact that human beings have that sort of motivation. Because of man's fallen nature, there was a need for checks and balances among the powers of the state. Thus, the founders designed American government in such a way that each of the branches of government has specific powers, and that these powers are counterbalanced by the other branches. The Bible teaches us uh, a, a political way of thinking that recognizes the authority of the state, but also recognizes the limits of the state. It teaches us that human beings are fallen, sinful, therefore that they need government, but the government itself, being uh, composed of human beings, also needs government. That is, you must have some means of governing the governors. And this is what gave rise, for instance, in, uh, in American history, to our separation of powers, to the federal system, where we have a federal government, and state governments, and county governments, and city governments, where we have branches of government, uh, executive, legislative and judicial, uh, these all are designed to provide uh, checks and balances, limitations to the expression of the sinfulness of man, even when he becomes a part of government. Because after all, as the founders recognized, passing the civil service, uh, service exam does not suddenly make one instantaneously sanctified. <laughs> a government based on Christian principles will be able to retain basic human freedoms and protect basic human rights better than other forms of government. Today, human rights are under immense attack. There are many worldviews that deny the creation of humanity in God's image and deny the foundations of his laws. Many governments elevate the state at the expense of the individual, causing their citizens to suffer. The Bible is very clear about our social responsibility. First of all, Jesus said, render to Caesar the things that are Caesar's. And in our particular form of government, in a federal <laughs> republic, sometimes called a democracy, we can elect Caesar. So we have a special responsibility. We don't have to just obey governments. Romans 3 tell us that governments are ordained of God, that we're to obey and respect uh, the government. But we can help elect the government. First Timothy chapter 2 tells us what kind of government we should work for, pray for, and elect. One that will lead to peace, justice, godliness, and an open door for the gospel. There are at least four characteristics listed there. And the kind of governments that will do that are the kind that we ought to promote, and the kinds that don't do that are the kinds that we ought to oppose. A lot of Christians are somewhat negative on the concept of politics and what is entailed in, in the term. But the, the word politics simply means the rule of a city. 
And in a broader context, God rules the universe. And in fact, God created government. And government has to do with politics because it has to do with rulership. And the Bible makes it very clear that when the righteous are in authority or in rulership, the people rejoice. And when the, when the ungodly are in authority, the people moan and groan. According to the biblical Christian worldview, human government was instituted by God to protect people's unalienable rights. This simply means promoting justice. Scripture seems to indicate to me that justice means rendering impartially and proportionately to each his own in accord with the right standard of God's moral law. That is, we should have uh, laws, laws that uh, reflect the, the rights and wrongs taught us in Scripture. Those laws should apply equally to all persons in all circumstances. We should not have favoritism. There should be no partiality. Uh, the rewards and punishments for various acts should be fitting to those acts. Uh, thus, for instance, we don't, uh, we don't exercise capital punishment for petty thievery, but uh, capital punishment for murder is certainly appropriate. Uh, neither, do we, neither do we let a murderer off the hook easily. Uh, the punishment should fit the crime, so to speak. And there should be some objective standard against which these laws and their application is measured, the standard being the moral laws of God. When governments fail to fulfill their God-given responsibilities to defend their citizens, protect human rights for all, and promote justice, Christians should be the first to demand a high standard of justice as revealed by God. They should call on the governing authorities to repent, to revive justice and order, and to restore goodness and peace to society. When unjust laws are enacted, Christians should rise and protest. Anything jump out at you? Kind of a summary of what we've already talked about, right? A couple of good points in there said a different way, but makes good sense. So let's kind of wrap it up here. Been a little long, but uh, government exists to secure a safe overall community in which individuals can express their God-given talents. Live free, right? We talked about this last week. The order of the institutions, God first, then family, then church, then state. Not the other way around, right? It says in the book of Acts, we must obey God rather than men. God comes before men. Men cannot command us to do what God forbids, and, and they cannot forbid us to do what God commands. Government does not have that authority in our life. It does not have the right over the individual to serve as God. Francis Schaeffer said, the bottom line is at a certain point, there is not only the right, but the duty to disobey the state. Exactly. We cannot yield to the state when it conflicts with our God and what he has asked of us to do. So I told you before how we can look at a worldview from any one of these particular categories. So let me just quickly show, if we take a political, biblical worldview, then our theology says that government roots are always religious. Everything about a government is established by God. Right? He's the source of liberty and justice that we're supposed to administer and protect. If we look at psychology, our sin nature requires our governments to have checks and balances. If we look at sociology, the state should not interfere with the domain of the family and the church. If we're going to look at philosophy, governments are supernaturally influenced. There is a God that can turn the heart of the kings, right? There is a supernatural, non-material aspect to government. Biology. Government should protect human worth and life itself because, after all, human life is made in the image of God and is one of the primary rights that our government is to protect is the right of life. Nations should be governed according to God's moral code. That's how politics intersects with ethics. So politics, the rule of a city. right? God established government to punish wrongdoers, protect and maintain a free and orderly society. Punishment should be rendered impartially and proportionally according to God's moral laws. Liberty and justice for all is a concept rooted in God. Good political philosophy understands human beings are fallen and cannot be trusted to do the right thing. I like what he said, they can be trusted to always do the wrong thing, the selfish thing. Therefore, government needs government. We should work for, pray for, elect a government that will lead to peace, justice, godliness, dignity, freedom, order, and an open door for the gospel. Governments protect individual church and family rights, but they are not always right. Only when they op oppose God can we oppose or disobey them. There's no 
earthly perfect for Christian government. There's a lot of different forms of government throughout history. Israel wanted a king, kind of started the whole thing. God said, no, mistake, you really don't want that, but if you want to do what all the rest of the nations of the world do, I'll give you a king. And people today still want a king. Although I don't know if they want any of the ones we get to vote for this summer. <laughs> uh, all right, so quickly, uh, again, we're looking at the creative order, um, all these things that we know about God so far. Now we're going to look at how that relates to Christ. In theology, Jesus is God. He created all things, has all wisdom, gives life. He gives our spirit eternal life because we have an eternal spirit. He reveals truth and grace to the world. His ethics should guide our world and our lives. Sociology, Christ came into the family. That's how he chose to introduce himself. And in politics, he has all authority and he is above all rulers. So we have a few things left, law, economics, and history, and you'll see that they're all tied to politics, which is why I wanted to introduce this one first. One other thing that came up in the, in the video, which was good, that when the righteous thrive, people rejoice. When the wicked, wicked rule, the people groan. Uh, more often than not, it's this, that governments try to make decisions on their own, and they never really get anywhere, right? They, they, they don't have a moral standard. But sometimes they do have moral standards which are wrong, and they often become downright destructive. It's like Lucy says to Charlie, you're just a baby, you have no rights, remember, you have no rights. Yeah. Our government says that today about babies. Yeah. They have no rights. So what are we told to do? Pray. Pray for America, right? We read this, pray for these people in high positions with all kinds of intercessions, but thanksgiving as well. Right? People who govern over us at every level. He talked about town, city, state, you know, every level. Pray for those in authority. It's good and pleasing in the sight of God for us to do that. There is going to be an imperfect government, right? Mm -hmm. Someday Christ will come and the God of heaven will set up a kingdom that will never be destroyed. Nor shall the kingdom be left to another people. It shall break into pieces all the kingdoms and bring them to an end. And it shall stand forever. And it'll be built on Christ, right? It'll be upon his shoulders, and he will forever bring peace to the world. His government will have an increase, will have no end, nor will the peace that comes with it have an end. He will sit on the throne of David, and he will establish it and uphold it with justice and righteousness forever. The zeal of the Lord of the host will do this. Amen? Amen. 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 All right. <clears throat> Next week, who makes the rules? You see politicians try to, very often they do, and not always incorrectly. There are some very interesting things about law and who makes it.